All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, it's great to be here. It's my first DevCon. Super excited. And today I'm going to talk about like basically uh, build and operate internet scale D apps on Stellar Network. Uh, but before I go to the technical content, I just want to say that we have a testnet app, and the testnet is not a black window that with uh, awesome numbers, but an actual app you can download and try today. Uh, and uh, uh, you can play some board games in it. Uh, but we only have it uh, in uh, Android available right now. Uh, so we're just going to show like basically a quick demo here. Uh, uh, that what, what this is about is this is like a, a game running on generalized state channel. It's a board game. It's basically connecting five. And you can create a game, and you can bet with your friend for 0.1 testnet ease. And uh, you, now you can, off you go, you can start to play. And uh, you can, uh, the important thing here is that uh, we want to show that state channel is actually going to help in terms of user experience, because you can see that each of the state transition in this kind of game is already implemented as generalized state channel or off-chain smart contract, as what we uh, call it. So this is kind of the user experience you can experience. And we also have the dispute protocol and the full sealed open, uh, fully implemented. Now, uh, with this, uh, we, we launched this uh, testnet app, including this application, on Ethereum San Francisco. And after, uh, about, uh, uh, after about three weeks, we have 900 installs, uh, 15,000 uh, 15, payments sent, and amazingly, 17,000 game is played over this 900 people. And uh, um, we, uh, the, the, the interesting thing I want to highlight is that this is all on testnet. If we put all these like, transactions back to back into this entire uh, blockchain, it will take 57 days to finish all these transactions. But amazingly, we have a 15% um, you know, user retention ratio for seven day user retention ratio. Even if like, people know this is fake money, they still stick on it. So this is like kind, of, kind of amazing thing that we think generalized state channel can bring to the table that is real mass user adoption uh, that is pending. And we, we have the SDK already released today, and multiple teams are already building on top of the SDK with uh, off-chain prediction market, some more board games, and uh, uh, some even uh, some SLA micropayment or like basically a microservices solutions. So you, you are very welcome to look up our uh, GitHub, and there are tutorials about that. So jumping to Stellar Network. Uh, what is Stellar Network is a coherent off-chain scaling architecture. Uh, what, I mean by, what we mean by that is Stellar Network has two parts. One is uh, the uh, uh, technology part called C-Stack. We propose a layered technology architecture. And the other part is C-Economics, which we propose some crypto economic construct to solve some challenges in the state channel networks. And uh, um, you know, for C stack, we basically solve the question of how to support generalized uh, off-chain scaling, how to route radio tr uh, transfer efficiently in this kind of uh, off-chain scaling networks, and how to bring mass adoption to off-chain uh, D apps by providing a, a better user interface and developer applications. So. Uh, C channel is the lowest layer. What is C channel is basically, basically our generalized state channel uh, construct. Uh, we, we came to this generalized state ch channel construct from the concept of a conditional payment and a conditional dependency. So um, uh, let me just like uh, give a quick overview here. This is like a channel spec. Uh, you can write. So w when you're writing a generalized state channel application, what you're writing is first part is a uh, smart contract. So uh, to write a generalized state channel smart contract in Stellar, you basically need to implement these kind of functions and also have these kind of uh, uh, you know, states in it. So I'm going to not talk too much in detail about that, but we have a separate talk I will refer to later. But the a key, part, a key part here is that uh, this kind of construct enable generalized state transition, uh, generalize the conditional state transitions. That is, like you can make a transition in your state channel and conditionally depends on some other transitions in some other state channel. And ultimately, you can build this is a rather complex uh, conditional dependency DAC to implement the complex uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, generalized state channel application logics. And to just uh, make it a, a little bit more concrete here, uh, to talk about like what we did in the game, for example, so let's say Alice and Bob have the channel, and uh, sorry, Alice and Mo have a channel, Mo and Bob have a channel, and Alice wants to play a game with Bob uh, and while betting on 0.1 ETH. Right, so uh, or, or betting on uh, five dollars here. Okay, so what's going to happen is that Alice is going to send Bob a conditional payment of five dollars uh, relayed via Mo, and in the beginning, the conditional payment will be like uh, uh, you know a boolean and condition group. There's a boolean and condition group on top of it. What what it means is that it, uh, only if condition 
C1 and C2 both evaluate is true, then this condition and payment actually goes through, right? So uh, there are two conditions in it. One is the, the standard multi-help intermediate uh, mediated transfer HTL registry condition. And so basically we generalize that HTL part also as a condition. Uh, and also the Alice and the Bob game. After this kind of a uh, pass got set up, um, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, you, you will see only one, we peel off the first condition and only one condition left, which is like a, the Alice and Bob's uh, game condition. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, when, when the game finally finishes, the Alice and Bob's, uh, uh, you know, a condition or state is entirely a pure off-chain object that you translate entirely off-chain. And when this uh, entire game finishes, uh, this uh, game gets resolved to an unconditional payment. So this is kind of like a, a process of how you can think about the generalized state channel in the conditional payment sense. So, in C channel, we have a bunch of out of box features, including opt-in address translator to achieve this kind of a pure opt-in object, meaning that this kind of a, uh, you know, opt-in uh, opt smart contract doesn't need to be exist on-chain uh, unless there is some dispute happening. We have a cooperative settling, we have single channel setup, which you, can, which you can set up the entire channel with just one transaction. Uh, you know, we have some uh, direct final state claim uh, functionality, dynamic deposit and withdrawal, and for the conditions, we implement some, uh, you know, out of box condition groups uh, called boolean and putting circuit condition and find a found assignment condition groups and they are all documented in our uh, docs. Now, this is like a, a quick overview of the generalized state channel construct we have. And the second layer of uh, seller's uh, technology architecture is called c -Rod. So the reason that we need a routing architecture is because we really want this kind of a mechanism or semantic to connect to this uh, off-chain state channel network once and use it forever, right? So um, now, uh, what? Why this uh, off-chain payment routing is so challenging, right? Uh, we talk, uh, Raiden guy, uh, folks talks about like basically why this, uh, uh, the, the, it, it, we, we need the optimal uh, routing, but why it is challenging. The reason is that the state channel network is very different from a data network. So for data network, the entire network is stateless. If you say it's a 100 megabit per second link, it's gonna stay 100 megabit per second no matter how, how much data will deliver through it. But for a payment network, the capacity actually changes as you deliver payment through each direction. And uh, using simple algorithms like shortest pass routing can break down the channel qu very quickly. And when the channel, uh, when, when this entire network topology is constantly changing, there's no way a decentralized uh, routing algorithm can actually work. So what we proposed is uh, called C-Route. And the principle of C-Route is to basically use the, the uh, follow the congestion gradient, or basically uh, try to figure out, okay, uh, this, cha this channel is too imbalanced, and uh, okay, then maybe we shouldn't go through that path, and we should maybe not go following the, the shortest path, but follow a longer path to basically, uh, you know, uh, try to maintain this uh, uh, overall balance of the network. And uh, uh, the second kind of a principle is that it will keep the channel balanced. And the key part here is that the C route is still a decentralized algorithm. Basically, you talk to your neighbor about like a, uh, the pressure you're delivering to each of the peers, and uh, the pressure information gets propagated uh, through the network, and we can basically uh, construct a, a routing algorithm on top of this. Now, the interesting thing about Seller, the C route is that it is the first ever provably optimal routing algorithm. It meaning that you know uh, we we can prove in theory that uh, given any kind of arrival process of their payment, uh, there is no other algorithm that can exceed the performance uh, of uh, Cirot in theory. But there are a lot of uh, implementation, uh, you know, challenges and the uh, things we need to do to carry this uh, forward in production. And uh, uh, there are several layers in the C-Route as well, but the, uh, that's the most uh, important part. In the simulation, we have observed uh, C-Route can achieve more than 20 times the higher performance comparing to naive routing algorithms like shortest pass routing. Okay, so COS. Uh, what is COS is a developer framework for uh, C apps. Uh, it is basically the protocol layer, uh, you know, Liam also talked about, and uh, it is handling all the complexity for the developers uh, to hide away uh, conditional uh, payment setup, uh, state channel setup, and the resolution protocols uh, among that. And it is also bridging the on-chain and off-chain bytecode, uh, meaning that today, uh, how do you write a uh, off-chain smart contract uh, uh, or, or a state channel application is that you write a smart contract first, and which, which support all these interfaces of uh, off-chain applications, and then you write a native app. 
which also contains uh, similar logics. Now, what, what we are aiming to achieve is that we hope to write one set of code, right? So you, you can just write one set of a VM code, uh, like EVM code, and let the EVM also running on mobile devices and web applications to act as a real backend for these web applications and mobile devices. So there is no need to write two sets of applications and create bugs at the same time. So uh, it is also easy to use run user runtime, which is a C wallet I just talked about. So this is like a, we talked about uh, how to support generalized uh, uh, conditional payment and uh, high performance routing and also the operating system side of Stellar Network. Uh, now we'll move on to the C economy, which is the crypto economic construct uh, of Stellar. And, uh, uh, you know, off-chain scaling or C-channel uh, achieves a huge amount of scalability, but it comes with trade-offs. What are these trade-offs? The first thing is a state availability challenge, which is how to make off-chain state always available for on-chain dispute, right? So uh, this is like basically the challenge. So Alice and Bob are uh, transacting each other money, and their newest state is sequenced with uh, sequence 49, and uh, uh, Bob goes offline, and what's gonna happen is that Alice can go to the chain and be malicious and settle a older state which is more favorable to Alice. Centralized monitoring is that, that's definitely a bad solution. Right, but uh, what about trust free monitoring? Well, trust free monitoring you can do right basically by letting Bob submit the current state to a trust free monitoring services, and the trust free monitoring service is trust free because the trust free monitoring service will also deposit an honest bond to the smart contract. And uh, uh, you know, uh, when, when Alice submitted uh, this malicious intent, the trust free monitoring services will submit the uh, you know uh, most current state. Uh, but if uh, the trust free monitoring services is malicious, the user can go all, uh, online afterwards and basically claim the honesty bond. But the problem about uh, uh, this is that it doubles overall liquidity lockup for this entire state channel network because now we not only need to everyone to lock up money on the state channel, but also need the, these monitoring services to lock up money on the channel as well. Uh, it creates a heterogeneous interface for state guarding because uh, maybe sometimes you are guarding this kind of token, other kind of tokens, or uh, some other kind of intermediate state that is hard to reason about what is uh, the actual value underlying that stake. And, uh, it is very obscure and expensive pricing model because it involves uh, locking up your liquidity and also we need to kind of uh, do peer-wise negotiating with the, uh, the, the monitoring services about uh, the price. And it increase, uh, incurs some complex on-chain, off-chain uh, interaction and gave you finally a rigid insurance model. You're basically insured with X percent uh, for Y price, right? So how do we solve this? We solve this by introducing something called Setter's uh, State Guardian Network. Uh, a state guardian network is a special kind of sidechain. Uh, you become a guardian by staking your seller token into the sidechain. Now, uh, when, you're, when a user is going offline or a device is checking in his state, uh, what it will do is that it will submit a state proof. And, and the state proof can be anything. It can be a game state, it can be a signed agreement, it can be auction acknowledgement, all that stuff. And uh, uh, the first question to figure out is uh, who is guarding the state then? Uh, so, uh, now, a randomly selected set of state guardian will be guarding the state, and the amount of state guardian or the amount of seller token at stake for this state is basically determined by uh, the income flow generated by this particular user comparing to the income flow generated by this entire network. So in this case, this user is paying $1 per hour, and the entire network is receiving $2 per hour, and this user is uh, basically have uh, uh, half of the state guardian covering for him. And of course, uh, uh, if you... Um, have like a, a more tokens staked in this uh, network, you get more work to do, and uh, therefore uh, get overall more income as a state guardian to perform the job to help user guard the state. Um, now, how this works in practice then? So, uh, Alice become malicious again, submit the older state. Uh, now, each of the state guardian randomly assigned will have a designated dispute slot. And th there is an anti collusion built in in this process, meaning that if the first state guardian is malicious and the second guardian can jump in and submit the state, and uh, the incentive for the second guardian is not only just take the fee from the user, but also taking the uh, you know, state guardian who didn't do his job properly, uh, all his seller tokens away, basically. And, uh, um, you know, in the worst case, uh, all the state guardians can be malicious and uh, they can basically not dispute for a uh, user's uh, uh, state. And uh, what will happen finally is that uh, all this, uh, um, uh, all this, uh, 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 so when user comes online later on, user can submit a proof of malicious behavior and all their seller token will be compensated for the user. Now, what is this? This is actually a very, very efficient pricing mechanism combined with a new kind of insurance model, right? So uh, 
you know, because user, when, when user is trying to submit a state, user is also trying to submit what is the payment associated with state. So uh, user can increase the level of payment to have more state guardians guarding for the users, or user can tr try to uh, choose to like uh, use a small amount of payment to have like a smaller amount of a guardian guarding for, for the state. Now, the, the reason that this is a new kind of insurance model is because what is Sarah token here is basically representing the income flow if you do the work in the state guardian network. And therefore, user is not insuring against X percent, but insuring with a speed to recover potential loss uh, if you know uh, there is a kind of a, a state uh, this kind of a uh, worst case happening even with anti collusion so this is how we solve uh, uh, this state availability challenge using a, a size chain construct effectively now the second challenge is called state uh, uh, connectivity challenge uh, what is connective challenge challenge is this basically you have Alice and Bob playing a uh, board game on state channel, and Alice is sending the winning proof to Bob. Right, so basically, Alice made a winning move and sent the proof to the Bob, uh, but Bob is refusing to sign it and rich quit. Now, what do we do? Uh, should Alice just submit this uh, state to uh, the main chain and try to punish uh, uh, Bob at the same time? Well, no, because blockchain cannot differentiate between these three scenarios. Uh, the first case is a Bob rich quitting. The second case is uh, uh, Alice uh, is actually maliciously trying to submit a state to the state uh, to to the Ethereum main chain. Uh, or there's uh, no one's fault. It's just uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the middle, there is some network problem between them. So we need a fallback data exchange fabric that is reasonably available and it can attribute, uh, uh, have attribution of uh, state availability time and it's also cost effective and doesn't require a large amount of resource from the end users. Now, Blockchain as a data availability service is the most straightforward answer. It is definitely available. Like uh, it's basically, we're assuming that everyone has some availability to this uh, uh, blockchain uh, in infrastructure. And uh, it also has attribution availability time. But the problem is that it incurs on-chain storage. And uh, we cannot even like, uh, you know, basically purge that storage uh, uh, relatively efficiently. And it requires OM monitoring. So, uh, we can get basically piggyback the state guardian network we just mentioned also as a data availability service or data connectivity service. It is reasonably available, has attribution of availability time because it constructed the like, uh, sort of like a plasma, and uh, uh, it, it doesn't have any on chain storage, and therefore it solves the kind of expensive problem uh, we are facing. Um, and it, it requires the actually, oh, I made a typo, basically. It actually uh, requires uh, uh, all login monitoring. We can introduce similar ideas of, of plasma cache uh, for this kind of a state guarding or a data connectivity uh, problem, which I'm not going into detail too much. So basically how it works is that uh, if Alice think Bob is offline, Alice will just submit a state proof to this uh, state guardian network uh, to, and wait for a timeout. And later on, Alice will just go on chain and start a true bit like one bit claim challenge with money bond. Uh, if Bob just respond with actual like a uh, uh, with this, if Bob responds this uh, challenge with also money bound, uh, what Alice can do is that basically pull out the stability testament uh, from the side chain and Bob will lose money. So, um, and if Alice is malicious and submit a state proof, uh, before the timeout actually run out, Bob will observe this state and respond also in the uh, state guardian network for this kind of a data connectivity challenge. Now, we talked about the state guardian, which is a compact side chain, created decentralized trust, and uh, uh, it has some collusion resistant, uh, expose a very simple unified interface. There's no additional liquidity lockup. Uh, create a very flexible economic dynamics uh, for pricing and also for kind of insurance model for your state. Um, and it, it also piggyback with a solution for data connectivity. And you stake Seller token into the state guardian network uh, and earn some service fees, basically. Now, uh, the third uh, challenge we have is network liquidity challenge. We envision in the future a state network, a state, a state channel network will look like this. You have a bunch of uh, big nodes which are the uh, um, off-chain service providers and smaller nodes which are the end users. And uh, how state channel works is like this, right? So you basically have some deposit from each side. And uh, the problem about this is like an off-chain service provider can run out of money pretty soon. Uh, and uh, sometimes there's a mismatch between uh, the uh, off-chain service uh, uh, provider's technical capability and their uh, capability to, to wail out like uh, capitals. And they will eventually result to centralization, which is uh, something that we don't want. 
And uh, how to solve that is uh, basically we construct something called a proof of liquidity commitment to the mining process. Uh, that is to say, we, we try to first incentivize a stable and abundant liquidity pool for this entire network. Uh, there are some liquidity backer has some idle liquidity and they can just lock it up in the uh, seller network. And for, for example, some uh, lock up 10 years for three years, some lock up for uh, 30 years for 20, uh, uh, two years, and uh, uh, their virtual mining power is basically the multiplication of these two. And the newly generated seller token will be distributed proportionally according to that. Now, when someone actually needs liquidity, they will just start an auction process. And different people will just start to bid in this auction with different kind of interest rate ask, and also with different number of seller token. We'll rank the, these bids by interest rate first, and also then by amount of seller token. So seller token here in this process also act as kind of a, a frequent flyer of a mileage uh, token kind of thing, and uh, for example, this guy will uh, finally win the bid, and this entire bidding process will be a second price auction uh, to get uh, enough liquidity for this option service provider to run. And there are tons of details how to in, uh, ensure security or enhance the security of this, uh, which I'm not going into uh, today. Now, we have the proof of liquidity community mining, basically mine seller token by locking idle liquidity in the auction platform and incentivize an abundant and stable liquidity pool, and also this liquidity backing auction to actually finish this process. So uh, again, we have the seller wallet running. Uh, feel free to download it at get.seller.app. Get, uh, get but uh, before my talk end, uh, I just want to also throw a quick vision of uh, uh, what do we call seller network 2.0. Uh, we have seen uh, a lot of like uh, uh, these things popping up uh, of off-chain scaling technologies, right? So we have a, a state channel, we have plasma, we have a, a side chain which is not quite plasma like a, a state channel, a state guardian network, and also we have true bit like uh, interactive computing uh, protocols. Uh, so. Each of the team is kind of working separately in different domains. Uh, what we think is that off-chain scaling uh, solutions are sharing um, you know, a high level, a similar high-level philosophies, and they can be combined as a coherent solution. That's uh, what we are already starting to see um, in the seller network construct, that we use uh, the sidechain as kind of a part of the crypto economic construct. Uh, so uh, that ends my talk. Uh, we have a, uh, you know, a very good team of uh, researchers, designers, and also engineers uh, on board. And uh, we are always hiring. Feel free to send an uh, um, email to hiring at seller.network, and it will go directly to my mailbox, basically. All right? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Uh, any questions? Yes. Yeah. So I have two questions. First, you, you have implemented an EVM here in your platform. I saw it in the white paper. Is that still happening? Uh, yes, that, that is in the, in the process. Um, you know, we're thinking about doing uh, you know, eWASM, actually. Uh, so, okay, so the EVM part is basically uh, how can we make uh, one set of code instead of two set of code for off-chain applications. Um, uh, uh, we, we, the reason that we are doing a EVM inside of uh, like a mobile device is uh, you can run EVM in mobile devices today, but what's the challenging part is to use that EVM as a backend for all the front-end interactions for the mobile platform. Right? So basically you click a button, it talks to not the Java code, but actually the EVM code. So that's kind of like the process uh, uh, we're, we're, we're doing, and uh, that's still in progress, yes. Okay, so um, you're not gonna implement EVM in the near future, or you are gonna implement EVM in the future? So, the, uh, okay, so let me just clarify that uh, it, has, uh, it has the capability to run generalized the state channel applications implemented the, as an EVM, um, so uh, we are in the process of like combining these two things uh, uh, together, basically the mobile platform or the user client part uh, and also the EVM. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs>